I want to thank the PyCon organizers, as well as everybody on the Python Software Foundation staff. Putting on a conference is a lot of hard work, and y'all have done a great job moving PyCon from Pittsburgh to online. I really appreciate having this opportunity to share my knowledge with the community. And to everybody out there watching, thanks for tuning in to hear me rant about if statements. We're going to have some fun. My name is Ali Sivji. You can find me on Twitter. I am at Kaya Sivjus. I'm one of the organizers of the Chicago Python Users Group. We call ourselves Chippy. Chippy is one of the largest Python communities in the world. We have around 6,000 members. And every month, we hold four to six events. Normally, I'd invite you all to come out to Chicago to hit up a Chippy event, but we've had to cancel all of our in-person meetups until it's safe to meet in large groups. But we have been engaging our community through various online platforms. A few weeks ago, Chippy started live streaming our events to our YouTube channel. Subscribe to our channel, hit that bell icon to get notified of our upcoming live streams. Hope to see y'all there. This talk is titled, If Statements Are a Code Smell. It's a bit incendiary, but I want to start off by saying, I'm not here to attack anybody. I'm not here to attack anybody's code. I just want to share my experience using a pattern that helped me write code that's a little bit more readable and code that's a little bit more testable. So what's an if statement? If statements are elements of a programming language that allow us to control what statements are executed, Usually when we're running a program, we execute it from top to bottom, executing one line after another. When we're hitting an if statement, with that condition being true, we get to execute a certain block of code and then continue. But if that condition's false, we get to skip over that block of code and continue like nothing ever happened. So let's make this a bit more concrete. Here's some Python. Our code here is checking to see if the variable today is equal to the user's birthday. If it is, we're going to print a happy birthday message. If not, we're going to skip over that and continue like nothing ever happened. So with if statements, we have the ability to tell a computer to do whatever we want when a given condition is true. And by chaining together a series of if statements, we can accomplish any kind of task we can think of. And this is a really powerful concept. And there's a reason that if statements are a fundamental building block in most programming languages. But if you have code with too many if statements, it makes things hard to follow and even harder to modify. What does it mean to have code that's hard to follow? This could be spaghetti logic, and here we're going to be scrolling up and down, tabbing between multiple modules, trying to follow the thread of the code to know what's going on. Code that's hard to follow is also long functions that do many different types of things. It could also be related functions that are not logically grouped together. And if we do a bad job in translating our solution into our code, it could be really hard to follow. This could be something like poor variable names or poor function names, or we could be doing something in a linear manner versus using a higher order abstraction. What does it mean to have code that's difficult to modify? When we make a change, we have to go and touch many different parts of our code base. When we're adding a new feature, we have to modify code we've already written to make this new feature fit. Code that's difficult to modify can have duplicate logic sprinkled throughout the code base. When we have to go and make a change, are we sure that we changed every single part we needed to? And when we have no tests, code is really difficult to modify. How do we know that the change we made works as expected? How do we know that the change we made didn't break existing functionality? We have no idea. When we have code that's hard to understand and code that's difficult to modify, we call that a code smell. And this refers to a programming pattern that might indicate that something's wrong. And I want to reiterate that. Code smells might indicate that something's wrong. It doesn't mean that there's a problem there for sure. If something's difficult to understand, is there a way we can simplify that logic? If changes are taking too long to make, can we modify our design so we can move faster going forward? The first type of code smell we're going to talk about is the compound if statement. 
We have one if statement in a code. It's fairly readable. We have a compound if statement. Things become slightly harder to parse. And the more complexity we have inside of our conditionals, the harder our logic is to understand. One suggestion I like to make is to refactor your conditionals into a Boolean variable or into a Boolean function. Going back to that if statement that has two conditionals, we can refactor that conditional into a variable that has a descriptive name, and then we can reuse that variable with a descriptive name inside of our if condition. And with that even more complex conditional that has that same value over and over again, we can refactor that into a function to make our code more readable. Another type of pattern that makes our code hard to read is nested if statements. When we have a series of nested if statements, it makes our code take the shape of an arrow. And there are some problems with arrow code. First of all, arrow code has high cyclomatic complexity, and this is a measure of the number of distinct paths through a code base. Code that has high cyclomatic complexity, it's hard to understand, and it's even harder to test. Also, when we have deeply nested if statements, it really limits the characters we can use per line. We're wasting all of our character count on white space. The second refactor tip I have is to flatten arrow code. In Chicago, we have a bike share program with a public API. And in my apartment, I have a dashboard that lets me know how many bikes are left to my closest station. Let's walk through that code that generates that dashboard. We're going to use the request library to hit the API. We're going to get a response back. If that response is a 200, we're going to grab that station data. We're going to loop through each of the stations inside of that uh, station payload until we find the one that we care about. And if the number of bikes at that station is less than or equal to our threshold, here the threshold's three, we're going to return a message. If it's greater than three, we're going to return a different kind of message. And then finally, if that response from the top is not a 200, we're going to maybe raise an exception and return. And this right here, it should raise some red flags. It's really far away from the code that it's related to. And there are many ways we can think about flattening arrow code. The main idea is that we want to return as soon as possible. In our example, we're going to write something called a guard clause, and this is going to turn our positive check into our negative check. So going back to that code, here we're going to write a guard clause that checks to see if the status code of the, of the response is not a 200. If that's the case, it's going to exit early. This leaves the rest of our logic unnested inside of our module. I also want to call out that I removed the else in that uh, block since I really didn't need it. The third and final type of code smell we're going to talk about is when we have duplicate if statements sprinkled throughout our code base. While the first two types of code smells we talked about, they're easy to identify and they're fairly easy to fix. This type of code smell, it's easy to identify, but it requires more knowledge about the problem before we can go and design a solution. We've all seen code like this before, where we have the same check littered throughout the code base. And honestly, this really isn't that much of a problem if we never have to change this code. But if we have to go in and change this code or go in and at least read this code, it might make sense to explore a different kind of abstraction. So what pattern should we use? As I mentioned, we need to have a deeper understanding of the problem before we can design our solution. Let's explore duplicate if statements with a case study. In the Chicago Python Slack, we have a community engagement bot called Busy Beaver. And one of the ways Busy Beaver engages our community is by sharing public GitHub activity in a designated channel for our registered users. How do we go about generating that daily summary? Recall, we can chain together a series of if statements to accomplish any kind of task we can think of. 
What's the algorithm to generate summary text for a single GitHub user? We're going to start by grabbing data from our API. Next, we're going to collect events by their type. For each of those event types, we're going to calculate some event statistics. And then finally, we're going to generate some summary text. For a minimum viable product, we're only going to want to track two event types. We only care about all the commits a user makes as well as all the repositories a user stars. Let's write up the steps we just talked about in our code. We're going to start by grabbing data from the GitHub API, and here's the code to do that. We're going to start by setting headers. We're going to hit that API, and then we're going to return our JSON payload, fairly standard use of the request library. Next, we're going to extract events of interest from that JSON payload. Here's the code to do that. We're going to loop through each event from our payload. We're going to collect events by their type inside of a dictionary. And then finally, we're going to return that dictionary. This dictionary is going to have a key of the event type, and the value is going to be a list of all the events of that type. And finally, we're going to generate a summary text for all the events that we care about. And this function, it generates a GitHub summary for a single user. So we're going to start by creating our header. We're going to go through each key value pair from our dictionary. And then we're going to update our text based on the event type. And finally, we're going to return that summary text we just generated. This is perfect. We created our MVP. We could get into the hands of our customers and start that learning process. Fortunately for us in Chicago, Everybody loved Busy Beaver, and they wanted to st uh, start tracking additional event types. So let's modify our code so we can start tracking an additional event type. And we're going to add all the new pull requests a user creates to our GitHub summary feature. Looking at that perform function from earlier, we're only going to have to go and modify these two sub-functions. In the extract events of interest function, we're going to add another conditional block to our series of if else's. And here we're going to check to see if the event type is a pull request event and the event payload has the action that is open. Remember, we only care about new pull requests a user makes. And in the generate summary from events function, we're going to add some logic that generates pull request summary information. Like before, we're just going to add another block to our series of if else's. That was fairly straightforward. Python makes things easy. Or was it? The generate summary function, it's already starting to get hard to read. Yes, I know this is on a slide. We're only using two spaces versus four spaces, but things are really hard to follow. And currently, we're only tracking three event types. Our users, they want us to track additional event types. You can start to see how this is going to get out of hand. Also, what about our tests? When we look at the diff between our tests for MVP versus our tests for MVP with this new functionality, we can see that we have to write a test to check this PR functionality works as intended, but we have to go back and modify tests we've already written to ensure this feature doesn't get triggered. And this is because the functionality that we're testing, this function does many different types of things, it's trying to generate a summary for many different types of GitHub events. So every time we add functionality, we're increasing the size of our test scope. And this function has a larger surface area, and it means we have more complicated tests. So if you ever find yourself having to modify code in multiple locations to add a new feature, or you're modifying tests you've already written to add new functionality, you might have some code smells inside of your repository. This was me last December. We just released our Slack bot and our customers wanted us to add more additional features. But I found myself fighting the program design I already had to make these new features fit. Around that same time, I started reading the book Clean Code by Robert Martin. He's affectionately known as Uncle Bob in the developer community. And this book, it has a lot of great advice on how you can write better code 
following a series of prescribed best practices. And one of the things that this book recommended was to refactor your conditionals using polymorphic classes. Yeah, I'm not really too sure either. So let's take a step back and talk about object-oriented programming in Python. Object-oriented programming is a paradigm that's based around objects. We try to model real-world things as objects. And when we design a solution, it involves a collection of collaborating objects that communicate with each other by sending messages. Objects have data along with behavior. And object-oriented programming allows us to think at a higher level of abstraction. We can create objects with set data and set behavior and then we can start performing actions on those objects to accomplish the task we're trying to do versus doing things in a sequential linear manner. In object-oriented programming, we have classes and we have objects. A class, it's a template that allows us to create objects. We can also say that we initialize an object from a class. I really like this cookie cutter analogy. Our cookie cutter, it's like a class, and each instance or each cookie is like an object. In object-oriented programming, we have four main principles. There's encapsulation, there's abstraction, there's inheritance, and there's polymorphism. Encapsulation bundles data and behavior into a single logical unit, which we call an object. With encapsulation, we're able to hide the internal representation of our object. Abstraction allows us to hide uh, complexity inside of our internal implementation inside of these objects. It's also recommended that when objects communicate with each other, they do so by calling their public methods. With abstraction, we're able to hide complexity. We're also able to isolate the impact of changes. We want to change the underlying implementation. We don't have to go out and change our calling code. Once we change our implementation, the calling code knows what to do. Often we have objects that are similar, but they're not entirely the same. With inheritance, we're able to extract common data and common behavior into our base object. And then we can use this base object to create children objects. And these children objects can reuse all the data and all the behavior from the parents. They can also override base methods to enable distinct functionality from the parents or from each other. And these children objects can also implement their own data and their own behavior that's not any way related to parent objects. With inheritance, we're able to eliminate our redundant code. Finally, with polymorphism, we're able to present the same kind of interface for many different types of objects. Imagine we have a collection of children objects. We can use our parent objects implement or interface to run each child object's implementation. With polymorphism, we're able to convert our conditional blocks into distinct objects. When we're programming using, when we're programming using the procedural paradigm, we have to use conditionals to selectively execute certain blocks of code. When we're programming using the object-oriented paradigm, we embed our conditional logic into our program structure itself, into our objects. When we're running object-oriented code, the type of object defines what behaviors should be run, what code should be executed. This is a diagram I pulled from Martin Fowler's book called Refactoring. You can sort of see how we can turn conditional logic into a class or an object hierarchy. Let's dig into polymorphism with a concrete example. Let's say we have a parent class called animal. The animal class implements an interface that defines a method called speak. And when we call speak on any of our children objects, it produces a different behavior depending on that object's type. So if we do a cat.speak, it's gonna produce a meow. A dog.speak is gonna produce a woof. This is that same object relationship in Python. So we're going to start by creating an animal. We're going to initialize it with a name. We're going to implement an interface with a function called speak. 
And note here that I'm just going to define this function to raise a not implemented error, since I just want to let people know that it's an interface, it's not actually being used. Now we're going to create a cat class that has animal as its base class. We're going to override that speak functionality and return meow, which is distinct for cats. And we're also going to create a dog class, override speak, and return woof. And that's distinct functionality for dog objects. And now when we call the speak method, depending on the type of object we're talking to, a different behavior is going to be produced. This way, if we ever wanted to add a new animal, say we wanted to add a duck, we could create a duck class, have animal as its base, and override that speak functionality and return quack to produce that uh, distinct functionality. Going back to that case study, how can we start replacing conditionals with polymorphism? When we first hacked together a solution, that's exactly what we did. We designed it over a weekend hackathon. It was really about getting something into the hands of our customers so we can start that learning process. But now that we have an idea of the problem that we're actually trying to solve, we can focus on the details that actually matter and design a better solution. So let's take a step back. What is this bot trying to do? Once we have a list of all the events that a user had, we want to start collecting them by their event type. And then for each of those event types, we're going to want to generate some summary text. It sounds like an event type or maybe an event list would make a good base class. Let's walk through the process of how we would refactor duplicate if statements into polymorphic classes. First, I'm going to want to identify our duplicate conditional blocks. There they are. Next, we're going to identify what each of these blocks does functionality-wise. On the top, we're trying to match events to an event type. And on the bottom, we're trying to generate a summary for each of those event types. Next, we're going to want to create a base class to model our problem. And so we're going to create an events list class that has some data, it has some behavior. For the data, we're going to want to keep track of all the events inside of a list. And for the behavior, we're going to be able to get the size of the list. We're going to be able to append items to that list. And we also have a function that returns true or false if a given event matches the event type that we're, we care about. And there's also a function that generates summary text for a particular event type. And since this is our parent class, it's just defining our implementation, or sorry, it's defining our interface, I'm raising the not implemented error. That's just the way I like doing things. Next, we're gonna to wanna to extract functionality from our conditional blocks into our child class. So here we're gonna create a commits class that matches events that have the type push events. And we're also gonna generate a summary that we expect to see. Next, we're gonna to wanna to extract functionality from our conditional blocks into our child class for all the repositories a user stars. And then finally, we're gonna extract functionality from our conditional blocks into a child class for newly opened PRs. We're gonna also wanna create a class that runs the process of generating a GitHub summary for a single user. I normally call this a driver class. So this class, it takes in a GitHub username, it gets a list of events, and it classifies them by type. And this, these are the only places I have an if statement in my code. When we're classifying event, we need to check that the event that we're classifying matches an event we care about. If it does, we'll add it to that event types list. If not, we'll continue like nothing ever happened. And the second if statement is to generate summaries only when a user has greater at least one event. And then finally, we're going to have to update that perform function from earlier to use this new higher order abstraction. The last time we try to add new functionality, it was a little bit painful. Let's try to use uh, let's try to use this new object oriented design and see how painful it is to add a new type to our GitHub summary. This time, we're going to track all the issues a user creates to that GitHub summary output. We're going to start off by creating a class. This is going to be called issues opened 
and the base class is going to be events list. We're going to add a function that matches all the issues events with the payload having the action that it is opened. And we're going to also have some code that generates the text that we expect to see. And then finally, we're going to go to, we're going to have to go back to that driver class and update the list of events that we care about by adding this one type to that list. Again, this seems pretty straightforward, but was it? Looking at the diff between our tests for object-oriented solution versus our tests for object-oriented solution with this new feature, we can see that we have to add a test that checks this new functionality. In contrast to a previous design, we had to modify tests we've already written to ensure this feature didn't get triggered. So yeah, I think this is a little bit better design. But like everything else in programming, there are some things for us to consider. First of all, we made our program design a little bit more complex. Anytime somebody goes into this code base, they have more concepts they need to understand. Maybe this kind of additional design complexity is something we don't want inside of a repository. So it's really worth thinking about how often is our code changed? If this is something that's modified a lot or at least read a lot, it might be worth taking some time to refactor to a better abstraction. This is why I really like following the rule of three. And again, I pull this from Martin Fowler's book called Refactoring. When you're doing something for the first time, you're really just learning how to solve the problem. Just figure out how to do it and do the job. If it's the second time you do something and you feel that pain, you're really still learning how to solve that problem. Just wince, duplicate your code. It's not a problem at this stage. But if it's the third time you do something and you feel that pain, it might be worth taking some time to find a better abstraction. Recall from the Zen of Python that flat is better than nested? When we're using inheritance, we want to be sure that we don't design program structures that are too many levels of inheritance hierarchy deep. This means that our code is going to be overtly complicated and overtly rigid. Instead of having to understand several layers of nested if statements, we're now having to understand several layers of inheritance hierarchy. So we just traded one set of problems for another set of problems. They always say that when we're writing object-oriented code, we should prefer composition to inheritance. With inheritance, we're saying is an object is a type of another object. With composition, we say an object has these type of behaviors. So it's a is a versus a has a relationship. Personally, I feel that inheritance is not that bad as long as you don't go too many levels of inheritance hierarchy deep. In a lot of cases, it's a lot more preferable to solve your problem by duplicating your code with copy and paste than it is to use the wrong abstraction. There's a fantastic talk about this by Sandy Metz from RubyConf a few years ago. Really recommend y'all go check it out. And I also wanted to give a shout out to my test suite. I was able to refactor my program design as I had set a high level test to ensure things worked as expected. Let's recap. We can use if statements to solve any kind of problem we can think of. But if we have code with too many if statements, it makes things hard to follow and even harder to modify. We talked about a five-step process, which we can use to refactor duplicate if statements into polymorphic classes. But remember, it's not worth wasting our time to refactor unless the payoff's actually worth it. Now you know how to use polymorphism to embed conditional logic. So go forth, refactor your code, make sure you do it responsibly. These are all the resources I found coming up with this talk. If you do have questions, please ask them in the comment section down below. Over the next few weeks to months, I'm going to be periodically checking in to answer your questions to the best of my abilities. I also want to make everybody aware that the project I talked about, Busy Beaver, which is the Chicago Python Community Engagement Slack bot, it's an open source project. All of our code is on GitHub. If you're an organizer of a community and you have a Slack workspace you want to engage, please reach out. 
we are open for multi-tenancy and are uh, looking for beta testers. I also want to give a shout out to the Chicago Python users group. I would not be where I am as a developer or really as a person without that fantastic organization. Thanks so much for your time and I'll see you all in Pittsburgh next year.